uh, give a brief uh, welcome before I hand over the mic to um, Bronwyn. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, just to note that we are recording uh, the presentation so and we can share the link for that recording with others if you're interested in sharing that with uh, people who aren't on the meeting today. One, one thing, one thing, Leo. Maybe we'll we'll turn off the recording after the Bronwyn's presentation, so people's questions and answers aren't recorded and they can be candid. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. Yeah, so sure. maybe give me a reminder if you see that it's still recording. If I forget to turn it off. Yeah. Okay. Um. So. Because there's so many people on the call, we're not going to go around the room uh, having everybody introduce themselves, uh, but I'll just give an overview of who's here just so that you're aware. We've got a, a number of uh, groups from the U.S. Geological Survey, um, including uh, the North Central Climate Science Center, and thanks to Brian Miller, who you know requested originally that we give this presentation and, and thought it would be good to open it up to other people. Um, we also have uh, some groups from the Nature Conservancy, including uh, the Land Fire Group and the Nevada chapter. And um, joining us also is Andy Gonzalez from McGill University. And Andy is one of the key collaborators who's been uh, working with Bronwyn on this connectivity work. We're not going to get into a lot of the details of how uh, Synchrosim works, uh, because we know many of you are familiar from working with STSIM. Um, but uh, having said that, I think you're, you're, if you're new to the Synchrosim platform, uh, you'll get a good sense of, of what its purpose is from this presentation. So I am going to turn it over now to uh, Bronwyn. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn my webcam on for a second, Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, just so you can see me and um, put a face to the voice. Um, but uh, I'll just turn it off for the slides. Okay. Um, yeah, so we have three objectives of the meeting today. Um, first is, is just to introduce you to Sync for Sim. Um, and assuming that most of you are existing ST Sim users. And we're going to show an example um, of how we've used Sync for Sim to link ST Sim with a number of other models in order to identify conservation priorities across the landscape. And um, ultimately, we're trying to see discussions uh, regarding next steps with Synchrosim in general and with the connectivity work um, in particular. OK, so let's begin with just a few quick thoughts on why we developed Synchrosim. So as a team, at APEX, we've been developing ecological models of different forms for over 25 years. And through this experience, we've found that we're often doing many of the same things over and over. Um, and in particular, a lot of our time, much of the work, especially with spatial models, is spent just managing the data that's going in and out of the model. And there's actually often a disconnect between complex models that are developed by researchers and um, those that can be effectively delivered to decision makers. So what's often delivered is actually either dumbed down versions of original models or just um, the results of complex models in a static report format, um, which leaves decision makers unable to really exercise the real models themselves and can prevent them from buying into um, the model's guidance. So uh, our solution then was to develop what we call Synchrosim. So what is Synchrosim? It's a software platform to deliver models to decision makers. Uh, at its core, it's designed to take care of all the sort of data management tasks that are required for complex models. Um, and its strength is working with models that are both stochastic and spatially explicit. And because of the general, generous support of um, several agencies, especially those shown here, um, Synchrosim is free. And Apex has been working on developing Synchrosim for close to 10 years now. 
Okay, so how does it work? Well, um, if you want to run a model in SyncRSIM, you begin by describing to it the format of all the inputs and outputs of your model, along with code that contains the calculations for transforming those inputs into outputs. Um, and then you can go about really using your model, <laughs> because you can keep track of different sets of scenarios of model inputs and outputs. Um, and really importantly, um, the models that transform the inputs into outputs in SyncroSim can consist of any number of um, sub-models um, that are chained together in various ways. And this is one of the main features I'm going to be demonstrating to you today. So this represents like a workflow that you would have, not necessarily just a single model, but often, especially in conservation applications, we're chaining together several models like habitat suitability, and then connectivity, and prioritization. So um, let's look at some of the key features of SyncroSim. Um, there's three that I'm going to point out. So the first one is um, that SyncroSim is really anchored around being credible. Um, so that's scientific credibility. And, um, you know, as many of you are involved with and you know very well, um, scientific models take many years to get right. There's such a giant process behind them, funding them, developing them, conceiving them, um, you know, implementing them, applying them, and managing a user base and integrating their feedback. It's just a huge process that is so valuable that goes into a lot of existing models. And SyncroSim, what it does is it allows those existing models to be plugged in right in their native format rather than rewriting them in a specific format or language. So it can, they can be models that are just written in R or Python or C, C, um, C Sharp, or they can be compiled programs like, for example, CircuitScape. And so a second way that um, SyncroSim promotes scientific credibility is the way in which it handles uncertainties. Um, it comes with built-in features that allow you to run just about any model, including spatial models, using Monte Carlo simulation techniques. Um, and finally, in the spirit of open science, we make all of the source code for the SyncroSim models that Apex develops publicly available. Even, um, for example, the code for STSIM is up on GitHub right now. And we encourage the same for models developed by others. So the second key feature that I'm going to talk about is um, that, that SyncroSim makes these state-of-the-art scientific models interactive, um, which is what's really going to allow us to deliver the models themselves to decision makers rather than just static, static model outputs. So all SyncroSim models have access to the same um, built-in customizable user interface that you should know from um, STSIM. Um, it gives you the ability to view and edit scenarios of model inputs um, and display both graphs and maps of your model outputs. And we're working this year, too, to make um, um, models, including SyncroSim, available to non-technical users through a simplified web interface. And so the last key feature syncrosim I'm going to mention is um, that it's highly scalable. It's been built from the ground up to handle very large data sets. And this is really important in the world of spatial simulations, particularly when run stochastically over hundreds of Monte Carlo realizations. And for example, Ben Sleer, who's on the call today, um, he's successfully run an STSIM model of land cover change and terrestrial carbon for the entire state of California that generated terabytes of model outset. So to support this kind of big data, um, we need to be able to easily break up large simulations into pieces that can run in parallel using multiprocessing, even just on your laptop, say. And for really big, um, really big simulations, we make it easy for users to run their simulations in high-performance computing environments, like um, on the cloud, on Amazon Cloud Computing Services, or Linux-based supercomputers and to move their simulations back and forth between their desktop and servers. So that was SyncroSim in a nutshell. <laughs> 
And now I'm just going to um, hand the stage over to Andy, um, our collaborator, who's been co-developing this application that we have for developing a connectivity conservation package in SynchroSim. Um, do you want to talk a bit about that, Andy? Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Andy Gonzalez. I'm a professor uh, in the Department of Biology at McGill University. And since about 2009, um, I've been working with a team of researchers, including Bronwyn, to respond to a remarkable quest from the provincial government, the Quebec government, for help to plan and design and prioritize a network of habitat fragments, in particular forest uh, fragments, that would contribute not only to the to a new vision for the green belt of the city of Montreal, which you see represented here in in the in the map, and on top of that, a sort of stylized layer of a, what what a you know a, a green belt built on the idea of a of an inter, interconnected series of forest fragments would look like. Um, and most recently, we've been extending uh, our approach to helping uh, municipalities. Uh, make decisions about forest fragments or, or any other ecosystem fragment within within the city limits. Um, and so the challenge early on was to think about integrated measures of bio uh, connectivity from short distance to very long distance notions of connectivity that would allow a large set of species. Uh, in this instance, the first instance, it was vertebrate species ranging from small vertebrates like salamanders and uh, rodents, right up to large vertebrates like deer and bear, um, and to provide a solution that was a model output that prioritized every forest fragment um, and its contribution to the connectivity of the entire network from the point of view of all of these species. So you can imagine uh, there are many hundreds of, of uh, fragments to be taken into account in the network, and that's uh, um, a challenge. And then we had to take into account each of the sort of the functional needs of these different species, their habitat needs and their movement needs uh, over various spatial and temporal scales. And it became apparent to us very early on that we were going to need to design a network that was functional and prioritized today, but that it would be senseless to do so if it didn't still remain connected and viable 50 or 100 years from now under some sort of uh, projected models of land use change and, and climate change. So that that's the sort of the, was the challenge that uh, I kind of brought to Bronwyn and Colin was well, how do we use SynchroSim to uh, run many scenarios of, of landscape change? and to allow us to continuously update the output from this model uh, in terms of patch prioritization and network identification under various futures of uh, climate change and land use change. And as you can imagine, that's a, that's a multiplicative process that leads to many combinations of, of futures. And uh, until we started working with uh, APEX, we really had no means to assess what a distribution of futures might look like. So by running a Monte Carlo process, the, the idea is that we will be able to uh, produce robust uh, and rigorous um, projections of how the networks should look and how they might change in the future under various business as usual or conservation contexts. So that's really the, 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 the marvelous opportunity we've had to develop this and extend it and take into directions where I think we're going to be able to work very directly with our provincial, municipal, and, and city stakeholders uh, and, and give them a flavor of what it is to work with these, with these models uh, in real time rather than just delivering a set of maps, no matter how good those maps look like. I think it's, it's there that where we can make the biggest impact and really affect decision makers by showing them how the model works and what goes into it and, and why they're not such a mystery. So I think I'll stop there. Great. Thank you, Andy. Um, that's awesome. So that's the, the motivation and um, sort of the vision we have for that this connectivity conservation package. Now, just follow up on what Andy said about how we're applying it now to this larger region. So he was showing previously sort of this um, where we originally came up with our approach, which was right around Montreal. And now we're working to extend it across the entire um, St. Lawrence lowlands. So for those of you that aren't from the East Coast or Canada, 
Um, the St. Lawrence River is this really important giant river um, on the East Coast that connects the Great Lakes out to the Atlantic. And it's got this really um, rich plain surrounding it that's you know, uh, dominated by agriculture and urban areas, but there's quite a bit of forest fragments um, within it. 28% of it is still forest. And so we're working in this, um, this landscape and we have land cover data that are 10 by 10 meter resolution. So there's 300 million pixels. Um, and the goal um, is consistent with what Andy said. You know, we're trying to prioritize which areas to conserve in this landscape to maintain forest connectivity now and into the future. And that's based on, as he said, a sort of a representative set. We've actually narrowed it down. Originally, we did it on 14. We've got it down to five species that capture sort of the functional traits of the vertebrate forest diversity in the area. And we're applying connectivity analyses for these species to try and capture the needs of the regional biodiversity. So that's sort of our real world application. But for the purposes of the demo today, um, I'm going to show you sort of this prototype that we're working with while we're developing the tool. Uh, so this is uh, a diagram of the sub-models that go into our overall workflow or our overall model. Um, so I'm not including all the relevant sub-models um, in this prototype. Most notably, we don't have uh, climate change in here. Um, but it gives a sense of how we change together multiple sub-models um, in our workflow. And the five sub-models are a landscape change model, um, habitat analysis model, two types of connectivity analyses, and a conservation prioritization model. And um, I just want to note again that each of these models themselves have gone through rigorous peer review. They've been published. Um, some of them are standalone models, such as STSAM, circuitscape, and zonation. Um, and we're interested in you know, leveraging all that great science that's gone into these models and linking them together to make the best decisions. So um, what happens is we begin by modeling landscape change. And we feed projections of future land cover into our habitat and connectivity analyses. And then ultimately, we derive conservation priorities um, based on those habitat and connectivity criteria. And I just mentioned again that um, the habitat and connectivity analyses are species specific. So each of these sub models uh, need to be run once for each of our focal species. And then the conservation priorities integrate the habitat and connectivity needs of all of our focal species. So, you know, in terms of data management, <laughs> we're managing quite a bit because we're managing across species, not to mention iterations and time steps once we get um, into spatially stochastic models. So I just wanted to visualize a little bit of these inputs and outputs. So there's these um, external inputs that go into each of the sub models. And then there's also these outputs that are generated um, from a submodel need to be massaged and then converted to the right format to become inputs for the other submodels. So this is gnarly, especially when you multiply it across species, iterations, and time steps. It's a lot to keep track of. And you know, if we're delivering to a stakeholder just a static map of these final outputs, we're losing a lot of the richness um, and they're losing a lot of ability to you know, um, modify inputs for particular submodels based on their knowledge and needs. So um, the way that we, what we've done by wrapping it up in a package um, is we wrap up our whole workflow and then the SyncroSim package is, it's really just um, a model made up of these submodels. And SyncroSim does the work of managing the inputs um, and uh, the outputs. Um, and it does all the work of transferring those sort of um, intermediate outputs between the submodels. And then that's what allows us, once we've kind of organized like that, that's what really allows us to explore, um, you know, consider different scenarios of inputs and compare the resulting scenario of outputs. Okay, so let's get into a concrete demo. Um, just going to get out of presentation mode here. And um, so for the demo today, I'm going to show you um, the prototype we've been working on. We needed a simple uh, landscape had to work with, a simple model and a simple landscape. So we took the, a model of Hawaii that was uh, developed by Colin, Leonardo, and, and Ben. 
Um, and they developed uh, this, this model to illustrate how to build a state and transition simulation model. Um, so if we just scroll, scroll down, I can show you here in their figure four. So this is um, the model they have for Hawaii. These are the initial conditions of all the land cover types they have. Again, it's, there's not too many, which is nice. <laughs> and, um, and what they've done is they've parameterized the transitions between all of these land cover types. So that, that itself is the STSIM model. And we're going to focus just on the big island, uh, again, just for this prototype to make it manageable and make it run quickly so I could show it to you in real time. And so what their model does is, you know, you're going to see these maps. So here's the initial conditions, and then it runs into the future projected land cover out to 50 years here to 2061. So this is just showing you one scenario, um, one iteration of what a spatial map would look like of a pattern of land cover change into the future. So this is what we're using as the base um, as our landscape change model or our land cover model. And then we're going to assume that we're some kind of forest manager and we want to make decisions about which forest areas we should conserve in order to maintain the connectivity of the forest um, on, on the big island. So let me flip over now to the SyncroSim user interface. Show you what this package looks like um, and how it works. So let's imagine we're going to start by, and this is familiar to those of you that use STSIM, of course, because STSIM, <laughs> you're using the same interface. Um, but so when you start, open a new library, uh, you have to select um, which package that library belongs to. And so there you can see that one of the options is STSIM, which is the one that you've probably been using so far. But for today's demo, we're going to need the CONCONS, the Connectivity Conservation Package. And so that's what it does. I'm going to actually um, open up um, one that I've already parameterized for Hawaii. Uh, so it's the same idea. I'll just close this other, this one I just created. Um, and so here, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of, of what this model looks like. So similarly to STSIM, we start with some project definitions. And this is the currency of our model. So for this, in this case, we have, I'm going to show you for just two species. You can imagine we have many focal species. And um, here's a, a tab where you would put your um, project definitions for your landscape change model. This is just the STSIM project definitions. It's actually exactly the same. You're used to seeing it um, laid out horizontally in different tabs. So each of these different project definitions, things like your land cover states. But we've just dropped them down vertically rather than having them spread out horizontally. And that's, again, we're just emphasizing this is, you can, the user interface is totally customizable um, around whatever works for the model that you're trying to run. And in this case, we have these two pieces to our model, so we wanted to represent it this way. Okay, so I'm going to show you now what some of the scenarios would look like. First of all, um, let me open up some sub-model scenarios. Um, I want to show you right off the bat um, how it's organized. Again, we customized this user interface so that it would match exactly um, that diagram I showed you of our submodels. So what we've got across the top, we've got a tab that um, controls the total overall run control, so your, how long you want your simulation to run for and the total number of iterations. Um, initially, what, I'm going to run it live, and I just wanted to have two iterations, two time steps, so it runs really quickly. And then in these other tabs, we, we're mirroring exactly our submodel. So here's all the parameters related to landscape change, to our habitat model, to our network connectivity and circuit connectivity, and then finally um, to conservation prioritization. So those tabs correspond. You can put all the inputs for each of those submodels in there. And so for the landscape change model, again, this is all of your STSIM um, scenario parameters. And again, you're used to seeing them um, horizontally all spread out when you're just running um, STSIM as a single model. But we've dropped it down. All the parameters are now um, available vertically here because this is just one sub-model among many that we're interested in running. Uh, so let me just run, show you how you can run these pieces. So I'm going to run, you have options. You can run all of your submodels in one big shot, or you can actually run them individually in pieces. Let me just run this one individually. 
I'm just running the landscape change because that's the first step model. And um, you know, you've got this really handy progress bar that tells you how far along your model run is. So that's it. We've run our uh, landscape change model. And now we want to run um, habitat analyses. So we take those land cover projections and we want to um, run the habitat analyses on them. And actually what we can do is we can just drag the outputs from our landscape change sub model into our habitat model. And you see that this input tab now for habitat gets populated with the outputs of the landscape change sub model. And these are just our state class maps. So we're just gonna base our habitat definitions on state class. So now I'm gonna run just that next piece, which is the habitat suitability piece. And while that's running, I'm going to just mention that there's other inputs we also need to put in for habitat suitability, things like um, species-specific suitability values, things like minimum habitat patch size. You can put anything in here. Again, this is just a prototype. We've put basically the bare minimum to just make it an interesting example. Um, but yeah, you can, you, I mean, you can have really complex habitat models in here with lots of parameters. And so down here we can see that um, it's running. What it's doing for habitat suitability, because it's an R script, is it's gone and it's launched R and it's sent all the necessary state class maps um, and inputs required to run that, that habitat suitability model in R. And then it's going to push them all back into our database. So once that's run, um, so now we have some habitat uh, habitat suitability results, we're going to want to run our, our network connectivity and our circuit connectivity. So I'm going to go by these pretty quick, um, just so we can keep moving to the end. So I'm going to drag the outputs of habitat now into our network analysis. So these are habitat patch maps and resistance maps. And I'll just run the network connectivity piece. Again, this is an R script. So SyncroSim is um, taking all the necessary inputs to that R script opening up R, feeding in the inputs, and then it's going to save the results um, in the appropriate place in the database. Um, and again, you can have different types of dispersal parameters relevant for different connectivity metrics. Um, those can get input as well, and those are related to this habitat connectivity submodel. All right, um, so we also need to um, use those results from the habitat um, when we're running our circuit model. So um, this uh, circuit connectivity is really just running circuit state. So I'm going to drag in the results of my habitat suitability modeling, which among other things created resistance maps. And um, I'm going to run this circuit connectivity, run circuit state. So now SynchroSim is um, going external, running, sending these resistance maps out and running CircuitScape. And of course, there's definitely other inputs you could put into CircuitScape, like, you know, if you want to have inputs about what your source and output um, areas, pixels are. But for the demo, we've just kept the um, inputs really minimal. So we're just sending over the resistance maps and we have constant um, uh, source and outputs um, for, the, for the circuit model. So it's running, um, as I said, it's running CircuitScape externally. OK, so that's great. We've got our three pieces now. And the last piece, um, we've got our three inputs. And then the last piece for conservation prioritization, we're going to consider three conservation criteria. So we're going to consider the habitat suitability, which we get from the habitat model. So that's all our habitat suitability maps. We're going to consider all of our network connectivity maps. Grab those. Those come in there. And then we also want to consider our circuitscape um, outputs, our circuit, our current flow maps. So those get populated in there. Um, so let me run the last piece, which is conservation prioritization. So now SynchroSim is going and taking all those uh, conservation criteria maps and running zonation. So that's a piece of an external software well known in conservation planning that does spatial optimization. So across a lot of conservation criteria. And so, um, you know, we grabbed the uh, conservation criteria from our different sub models 
And there's also a bunch of run settings. I've just exposed a few of them in the user interface. These are things related to the optimization algorithm um, behind donation. Um, so it's going to run, again, it's going to run a prioritization um, for each iteration and each time step. But each prioritization will have the requirements for all of the species. And so one thing I want to mention is that, let me close that. Okay, so that's done. And so that was really to illustrate to you how these models are chained together. Um, and I'm going to show you now um, some results, but I'm going to show you some results of a scenario that I pre-ran with more than two years and two Monte Carlos that had 50, out for 50 years and, and six Monte Carlos. Um, and I want to emphasize here that um, the, I ran these using the run all mode. I didn't actually run them individually and then um, drag the outputs as inputs between models. I just hit run all. And this is what you want, definitely want to do for your final production runs. But it's really nice to have that ability to um, run them individually because you know when you are working on these things, you might just want to modify some dispersal parameter and just change that piece and go down your um, workflow rather than having to rerun the whole thing. So it's really nice to be able to run them individually, um, but then of course running them all together is, is essential as well. So that's what I did um, for these big bigger runs. And I'm just going to show you some results now. First I'll start with some maps. So um, this you'll recognize from the paper. This is just time step uh, the initial conditions actually. I'm going to show you, I'm not going to show you every year a 50 year output, but I'll show you um, sort of a smattering across time. There's three years. You can see, and here's our state class types. So these are all of our state classes and how their pattern and amount is changing through time. You can see we're getting quite a bit more urbanization um, through time. And then we can also look at now some of the other outputs of the other submodels directly in comparison. So here, for example, are some habitat suitability maps for our two species, Hawaii creeper, Maui parrotbill. The green areas represent suitable habitat, and the gray areas represent sort of the matrix. And you can see, I mean, they're both forest dependent, <laughs> so they're pretty similar. But um, if you look at their habitat patches specifically, let's just look at binary habitat patches. Um, here you can see that the Hawaii creeper can't make use of the small forest fragments. It has a higher um, minimum patch size requirement, so some of those smaller forest fragments are dropping out of its potential habitat maps. And um, now let me show you some of the outputs from connectivity. Let's close these so you can focus on the right legend. So here, for example, here's a network connectivity measure where the um, red and orange are the sort of most important patches for connectivity, and the blues are the less important patches. And so you can see for a particular species, uh, through time, the um, importance of patches can change. Of course, it's different between species. And I just make a note about these maps that we're just looking at one iteration. You can look at any particular iteration you want. And of course, they'll be different because this is spatially stochastic, spatial and stochastic. Um, and so let me show you then, uh, maybe just quickly, the, the outputs of circuitscapes and current density maps. Um, let's close these legends that you don't need. And so here is the output of um, when Synchrosyn went out and ran circuitscapes and brought the um, results back in. So for the two species, again, this represents flow across the landscape. And then finally, our big take home, <laughs> or the thing that often is the main thing that gets delivered is um, these conservation priority areas. So let me just, sorry, I'm just closing all the old legends so I can explain the legend for these spatial conservation priorities to you. So um, basically, um, we've got three colors and in red, that's the top 5% of your landscape in terms of those are the most important top 5% of areas to protect. And if you include the green, yellow, and red, all together they represent the top 17% most important areas 
um, of forest in Hawaii to protect um, based on those conservation criteria. Criteria, And so, um, and again, that's for one iteration. We can look at a whole bunch. Um, and let's look, since we're interested in multiple iterations, let's look at uh, the charting actually summarizes that better. So let me make a quick chart for you. Um, where I'm going to show you some state classes through time. I'll just show you a couple of key ones. Let me show you um, developed and forest. Here we go. And um, we can add on, let me make that big so you can see. We let's add on um, some confidence intervals just based on the min and the max of our six iterations. You, know, you can see that um, developed area is increasing through time and forest starts to decrease around 2035. And let's throw on another um, scenario so we can actually have something to compare to. So, um, here now we're comparing um, how the landscape changed through time under two different scenarios. This, so the first scenario in blue is our base scenario, and the second one is one where we assume there's a lower rate of urbanization. I assume there was just a quarter as much urbanization in that second scenario. And we can look, of course, also at what's happening with um, connectivity. Let me make this big. Um, now, there's a lot of metrics we can plot for connectivity. We've just got a couple right now in our user interface. So let me just show you one, a measure of connectivity, and I'll just show you for one of our species. So here you can see, you know, we see how our, our forest is changing through time, and then we can also see how that affects um, our measure of connectivity through time um, under two different scenarios. And then the last thing I'll just show you quickly while we're comparing scenarios um, is here now our, our, we've got our, our maps for under the two different scenarios. So there's a base scenario and the low urbanization scenario. And so you can see that you know if you look at the land cover, there's a lot more urban in 2061 under the base scenario than under a low urbanization scenario. And you can look at the, how that affects any of your um, intermediate outputs, but if you want to look and see how that's going to affect your spatial conservation priorities, well, actually, in this case, um, the let me just scroll down so you can see. Oops, sorry, um, you can actually see that the conservation priority areas aren't that different under these two different land land cover change scenarios. So, in fact, the priority areas are more or less similar, despite what we see as quite dramatic differences in the in the land cover at year 2061. And you can just go crazy looking at all the different iterations. <laughs> and um, so I'm going to stop there uh, so that we have some time for discussion um, and questions.